Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. I'm very happy to welcome you uh, here and say hello from Costa Rica, where we are based on the Earth Charter Center for Education for Sustainable Development that is located here on the campus of the University for Peace. Yeah, I'm going to uh, just share with you that we are organizing these under the Un our, the umbrella of our UNESCO chair on education for sustainable development with the Earth Charter that uh, we coordinated here, coordinate here for the past 10 years, actually, from our education center and the University for Peace. We do that in collaboration with different partners uh, from around the world, especially with a focus on the on research and education on that intersection between sustainability, uh, planetary uh, uh, consciousness and values and education. So I'm going to invite our moderator today. I have, we have the honor of having Akpezi Ogbuye from Nigeria uh, joining us today, and she's going to be our moderator. Akpezi served as the head of, <clears throat> of the Environment Education and Training of the uh, United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, for many years. And she has been a lead focal point for the UN Decade on Education for Sustainable Development. So thank you so much, Akpezi, for taking uh, this uh, the lead in this uh, conversation that we are going to have today. Akpezi, your mic. You have to open your mic. Yeah, thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you for everyone who has registered for what is going to be a most um, informative, interesting, and inspiring um, webinar. Um, welcome to this um, Ed Charter International Educational Webinar Series. And the topic is Rethinking Education for the Current Times, a conversation with Fernando Remas and Miriam. Vilela, and I am Akpezi Ogwebwe. I will just be moderating the program. Now, let's just start with a few questions to stimulate your mind. Is your mic closed? Sorry about that. Let's start with a few questions to stimulate our minds. How can the purpose of education be reoriented towards fostering a culture of care, peace, responsibility and ecological consciousness? How do we envision bringing values and ethics more to the center of education? Is education a global common? How can you be involved in impacting education for the future? Yeah, today's webinar would be looking at all those and our speakers will be giving us an overview of one, the UNESCO's futures of education initiative and report. I don't know if you've heard about it, but you will know all about it today. Two, the UNESCO agenda on ESD, ESD 2030 roadmap. And thirdly, we will hopefully identify synergies and opportunities between the two and other similar efforts. So the purpose is to share information about these, promote and raise awareness on these opportunities as well as engage more individuals and institutions in these efforts. You are all included in this process. The United Nations, especially UNESCO, placed high priority on the transformation of education to contend with our current challenges and help shape a better future. The invitation to rethink education is not only for governmental institutions, but all individuals and institutions working in the learning space. We are all called to rethink and reimagine how education can help us build a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. And if not education, how else? <laughs> what else? So let's quickly go to our first speaker. Our first speaker is a man that I am excited to meet. He's had over 40 years engagement with education that matters, education that can help students get out of poverty, education that can help students live a sustainable life. And he has, can you hear this, 45 books. So Google his name and you'll get a list 
of all the books that he has written on the subject. Right now, he is a member of the International Commission on Futures of Education, conveyed by UNESCO. He is responsible for, I mean, no, the commission is responsible for drafting the report, reimagining our futures together, a new social contract for education. This is part of the Futures of Education initiative. So Fernando will be giving us an overview of UNESCO Futures of Education initiative and report. And immediately he's through, I'm going to just call on Miriam Vilela, another lady who has committed her whole life, I would say, to the course of education for planetary well-being, education for sustainable development. A woman that lives the top, a woman I respect so much. She happens to be the executive director of the Earth Charter International. She also oversees the various courses on the subject that is run by the Earth Charter International. So if you want to learn more, just go on the Earth Charter website and there are so many courses. Nobody has any excuse not to know today. She is also the um, UNESCO chair you know, on ESD based in the Earth Charter at the University of Peace, Costa Rica. So she is going to be sharing with us an overview of UNESCO ESD 2030 roadmap. So can you please um, fasten your seatbelts? And while we are doing that, please keep the chat box active. Write your suggestions, write your comments because you are part of this process. You are part of the process. When the report is going to be compiled, let your name be there. And your children are going to say, yes, that's my mother, that's my father. They were part of giving us this good education that we have today. So, Professor Fernan Fernando Remers, you have the... Thank floor. you so much, Akpesi, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Miriam, for the invitation. And to all of you for the privilege of your, of your presence this morning. I'm going to share some slides so that I can support the few ideas that I want to present. Are you able to see my slides right now? Let me start, let me start back in 1948, a very difficult time in the history of humanity, when in response to a very dark period, uh, the community of world nations came together and asked, how do we make sure we, have, we create the conditions for sustainable peace? And they came up with a wonderful idea, 30 articles that basically say every human being should have these rights just because they exist. Whether they are a woman or a man, whether they are of this country or another, this religion or another, this race or another, this socioeconomic group or another, these are 30 rights that people have because they exist. And this became the moral compass of the United Nations. It was a wonderful response to this dark period, World War II, and to the genocide, where a lot of people, uh, you know, and, and, and the intentional annihilation of the people, of the Jewish people, of six million people. And the, the community of nations looked at that and, and asked themselves, how did we let that happen? How did we turn a blind eye to this horror? horror? And how do we make sure this never happens again? Now, let me show you that ideas matter and goals matter. One of the 30 articles is Article 26, the right to education. And I can tell you unequivocally that that article changed humanity. Because at the moment this article was adopted, there were 2.4 billion humans on this planet, of whom only 40% had ever set foot in a school. And today, eight decades later, when we are 8 billion humans, 95% have not only set foot in a school, but spent a considerable period of our lives. To me, this is the most significant silent revolution in the history of humanity. And it began with an idea, with the idea you have in front of you. That's why the work of organizations like UNESCO matters. This is a chart that shows the percentage of the population that had some access to school. Look how 200 years ago, only one in five humans had set foot in a school and how 80 years ago, it was only 40%. And look at how that share increases exponentially because we made that a goal. Now we live 
complicated times. Just to talk about the US, a few years ago, a group of neo-Nazis paraded in Charlottesville in the University of Virginia. Uh, just two years ago, there were people in this country saying, basically, you shouldn't wear a mask and producing a much higher mortality rate because of COVID than would have ne been necessary because they basically said, you don't need to follow the guidance of public health authorities. A little over a year ago, there were people who basically, or two years ago, invaded Congress and said, we shouldn't accept the results of an election. And then we have the crisis of climate change. And the United States is not alone. I would say this complicated life in which we live have been made even more complicated by the pandemic. Now, we need courageous people. Courageous people like a girl in the north of Pakistan, who some years ago, when she saw the rise of the Taliban who were trying to deny girls the right of education, began to write on a blog denouncing what she saw. The name of that girl is Malala. And we invited Malala to come here the year before she received the Nobel Prize. And when Malala walked into a stage with a thousand students and faculty who stood up to give her a standing ovation, Malala said, please, please sit down. I don't want you to think I have done anything extraordinary. It's only that in a context of great injustice, when no one does anything, the actions of a single person can make a big difference. Think about that. In a world of great injustice, the actions of a single person can make a dif big difference. And here's another young woman who at the age of 12 convinced her parents that they have to change their own consumption patterns to reduce their footprint, their carbon footprint. And at the age of 14, she began to demonstrate in front of the Swedish parliament asking elected leaders in Sweden to get on and introduce changes to address climate change. And at the age of 15, she had begun a global movement of school children around the world to do that. Malala and Greta Thunberg are examples of the kinds of upstanders that we need, of people who decide to become part of history. And I think the work of this commission is an invitation for each and every one of you to become an upstander and to become part of history and shape the course of human history. So three years ago, the director of UNESCO, uh, uh, Audrey Azoulay, put together a commission chaired by Madame, uh, the president of Ethiopia. And uh, you see her here in front of, the, uh, of this image. And this commission was asked to produce a report, to take stock of the world that we're in, to take world of the grave challenges facing humanity, and to say, what should education do about these challenges? Now, the commission basically thought that we are not going to be able to solve our education problems with the same kind of thinking that was used to create them, as Albert Einstein used to say. And we thought this is a time to be ambitious and a time to think differently. This report, uh, which I invite all of you to read, is an invitation for each and every one of you to be an upstander and to lead within your spheres of influence a process of reimagining the futures of education. Now, this is not the first report on the history of education, on the futures of education produced by an independent commission. The first time that UNESCO created a commission like that was in 1968, when it asked Edgar Faure, former Minister of Education of France, to chair a commission that produced a report learning to be. And the big idea of that report was that the social context, society was changing much faster than schools. And therefore, the most important thing schools could do was to prepare people to learn throughout their lives. And the second time that UNESCO did that was when in 1992, it asked Jacques Delors, the former chairman of the European Commission, to chair a commission that produced a report learning the treasure within. The most important idea of that report was that globalization was bringing together into contact people from different cultural origins. And unless we taught people to embrace that difference, we we're going to be facing a lot of social conflict because of those interactions with people who saw themselves as different. So what's new about this report? Well, what's new about this report is that the report has three sections. Part one of the report talks about what are the challenges that the commission sees? And the challenges are the challenge of climate change, the challenge of democratic backsliding everywhere, the challenges to human rights, 
the challenges to the idea of human rights, the challenges of growing inequality, and the challenges of increasing violence within societies and across societies. And the commission, the report says, in order to address those challenges, there is no quick fix. There is no simple solution. We need to reimagine the very idea of what it means to learn and to teach. And the third section of that report says, how are we gonna produce those changes? So unlike the two previous reports, which basically said, these are the things that are changing and this is how schools must adapt. This report turns that question on its head and says, these are the challenges that we're facing and schools must confront those challenges, not adapt. Schools must create a better future. Schools must create a new social contract, a new way of life. To do that, we need to rethink the very shared ideas, the mental models that we all have about what does it mean to learn and what does it mean to teach and how do we organize schools to do that? And so this report says we need to transform the culture of education by changing how we think about curriculum, how we think about pedagogy, how we think about what it means to teach, how we think about how we organize schools, and how we think about the connection among various educational institutions and the connection between them and other institutions in society. And to achieve those changes, the report proposes four catalytic actions. So the foundational ideas of this report, and this is a big difference with the two previous reports, the two previous reports were fundamentally addressed to ministers of education. They express a mental model that assume that ministers have the power to decree the transformation of education. And this report, I think because we wrote it during the pandemic, we wrote it in 2020 and 21, when it became so evident how limited governments were to produce changes in education and how powerful ordinary people were, how much power there was when all hands were on deck when students and teachers and parents and civil society and, and education administrators came together in a whole society way to transform education, we learned that this was the way forward. So this report is built on the notion that when it comes to transforming the culture of education, everyone is a change maker. And it is as much addressed to students as it is to teachers, as it is to parents, as it is to ministers of education. Secondly, this report is squarely and unapologetically anchored on the idea of human rights because we see that idea as being at risk. We see that we are living in a world where there are more and more people who question the fundamental equality of all people. And we see it today. In the United States, there is growing anti-Semitism. We have popular figures, artists, peddling, trafficking notions that suggest that people of a particular religion are less than, less human than other people. And if we just studied history, we would know how dangerous those ideas are and where they led humanity in the past. And so this report is anchored in the protection of that idea of human rights, which was created at the end of World War II to give us a world in which we could live in peace. Third big idea of this report is that education has to be authentic and relevant. What does that mean? Authentic means that what students learn in school, they need to understand the connection between what they learn in school and what they see outside the school. How good is it to be lecture about gender equality when you live in a society where you see that the basic idea of gender equality is violated every day? How good is it to be in a school that talks about empathy and solidarity and a world without poverty when you live in a society where we become indifferent to growing poverty around us? So what happens in the school has to connect with what we see outside the school. That's what authentic means. And relevant means that students need to understand the connection between what they learn and what matters to them. And the third big idea, fourth big idea in this report is that humans are multidimensional and education should be too. We are heart and mind. The goal of education shouldn't be to teach a few things to people. It should be to develop the full range of human potential. So I talked to you about 
the creation of the UN and how important it was to this article and how this article changed the world. And I've described the five ideas that this report proposes of what would it mean to transform the culture of education, to reimagine pedagogy, to reimagine curriculum, to reimagine the organization of schools, the profession of teaching, and the creation of the ecosystem. And to do that, basically this report says we need ideas, we need knowledge, we need engagement, we need solidarity. So we need more knowledge based on innovation and research. We need greater engagement of universities with schools and with networks of schools. We need everybody to step up. We need each and every one of you. This is why this conversation is important. We need each and every one of you to look in the mirror and to ask, am I doing my share? What am I doing to advance this transformation of education? Or am I just sitting here the way a passenger sits on an airplane waiting for someone to solve the problem? Am I doing what Malala did when she saw the Taliban closing the opportunities for girls to be educated or what Greta Thunberg did? Am I being the voice that in a context of grace great injustice steps up to challenge that? Or am I kind of watching it the way you watch a good movie on television or in the movie house? And we need a reimagined architecture. Now this report, unlike the previous two reports of the Futures of Education Commission, doesn't present itself as a finished document, not a recipe. It doesn't tell you these are 10 things you need to do. It's an invitation to a process of co-construction. It is the beginning of a conversation because the actual strategies to implement the ideas in this report in your university, in your schools, in the education system in Costa Rica, in the education system in the city of Bogota, those strategies have to be developed by local actors. And so I'm going to give you three examples of how to engage in a process of co-construction that actually show how easy it is to do that. So here's a publication, the product of collaborative work with colleagues at UNESCO, at the International Bureau of Education, where we basically looked at some of the innovations that had emerged during the pandemic. And we asked the question, to what extent are those innovations aligned with the ideas of the futures of education. In other words, to what extent was the pandemic a moment in which people, in inventing ways to sustain education, they accelerated the future. They build the kinds of things the report talks about. And there are 31 innovations in this report, I don't have time to describe them, that show you precisely how during this terrible moment for humanity, the calamity in education that was the pandemic, good things happen from which we can learn. And so my invitation to all of you is read the report and look at what is already happening around you that reflects the ideas of the report and put a spotlight on them. Learn from what exists. Um, here's a second example. With a group of my graduate students last year, they began to consult with a municipality. Some of them work with the municipality of Santa Ana outside of San Jose. Others work with different jurisdictions around the world, and they spent a semester examining what are the biggest challenges in this jurisdiction and how do they resonate with the challenges reflected in the UNESCO report on the futures of education. And they help the authorities in those jurisdictions come up with ideas, come up with a plan locally based, contextually situated to advance the futures of education. And so we published this book, you can download it on this link, as an example of what every university could do. Every university could be a co-constructor with an education authority of the futures of education. And the last example is this publication, which spotlights some of the dialogues that are already happening in cities, in countries, built on this report on the futures of education. Lastly, I want to show two things. During the pandemic was a moment of great loss, for sure, but also of great innovation. And one of the innovations that happened is that universities and school systems came together for the purpose of finding innovative ways to sustain educational opportunity during this pandemic. This book contains 20 such innovations. Those are the kinds of innovations we can learn from because one of the key ideas in this report is that we cannot hope to produce something as audacious, as ambitious, as the transformation of the culture of education, letting schools on their own to do that. 
Some of the schools are too small. They don't have the capacity to do that. But if you connect schools with one another in a network, and if you connect them to a university, now you have a scale at which it is possible to transform, to produce a really transformative curriculum on climate change, for example. And that's where I want to end. I have spent some time looking at existing efforts around the world to educate students about climate change. And what I have found is that the evaluation of those efforts show that not only are many of those efforts ineffective, they are counterproductive. In teaching the facts about climate change, they disempower students. They teach them this is so overwhelming that there is nothing I can do about this problem. However, there are some experiments that show that when you combine teaching the science of climate change with some form of project-based learning that engages students in activities that make a difference, however small, that combination cultivates the hope of students and the self-efficacy that Greta Thunberg discovered at a young age uh, in her country. And so what this book is, is an example of the kinds of things that are possible when you connect university students with school systems for the purpose of developing an effective curriculum of climate change. So I will end here basically reiterating my invitation to each and every one of you to read this report and to ask within your sphere of influence, who else can you bring to a conversation to begin to reimagine teaching and learning in the educational institutions that are within your reach. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Fernando. I mean, that was so exciting. And, and with the examples and the way he made the presentations, you know, it, you can see hope there that this is possible. Well, no, this is not rocket science, you know, education, for a better world, education for a, a world of equity, justice, a world of peace. It's not impossible if we commit to it. And like he ably said, he said, every one of us is a change maker. So it means that if one person is absent, then you know, you, there's a problem there. So we all have to mobilize. And also it means that even if one person acts like Malala or Greta, then big changes are possible too. So, and I was so excited when he anchored it on the human rights, because a lot of times we talk and forget that we already have a bigger social con contract without which all of us will not be here talking like this. Thanks to that, um, the Declaration of Human Rights. I actually was looking at it just before this meeting and um, there was, there was a reference to education right then in 1948 in the declaration. If you look at it, you will see that it says that say, we're proclaiming this universal declaration of human rights as a common standard of achievement for all people and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, you know, progressive measures. And that's what we are seeing now. Thank you so much, Fernando. We are going to um, have your contributions and questions, but let us also listen to uh, Miriam Vilela so that we'll be able to bring the whole documents together and, um, and uh, contribute. So Miriam. Thank you. you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Akpezi and Fernando. Wonderful to hear you. And thank you everyone who is joining us uh, today here. Uh, I, I was very happy to hear uh, how concise and, and to the point Fernando was on this report, which I think is crucial and very important for us to raise awareness and to understand what is inside this report and the, the Futures of Education initiative that doesn't end when the report was launched last year, it actually continues. But I see this as an opportunity for all of us to really awaken, uh, amplify our views, uh, amplify our understandings and our sense of care and responsibility, not only with the well-being of our closest community, uh, but also the well-being of others 
uh, people from other cultures or the countries or the regions or the places. And not only that, but amplify our sense of, uh, of responsibility with the large community of life. Uh, I think a lot of the efforts that UNESCO is doing uh, is now focused not only with the quantity of people ha that have access to education, but is really looking at the quality of education, but also the purpose of education for the current times, meaning um, the central role education could play or can play or has to play in, in transforming societies. Um, so I am also going to sh briefly share um, our PowerPoint uh, with you. Just a second here. Okay. For whatever reason, it's not going. Okay, so I see these as a, as a big wave. Um, UNESCO is working in different fronts um, with different education agenda and international policies on education to influence the generation of a big wave at the national levels and hopefully at what happens at the classroom level. Um, so I'm here to share briefly share with you uh, that there is a, a huge other efforts that UNESCO is, is leading, which is called the ESD for 2030, a roadmap. This was launched about 22 years ago, but it didn't start there, right? Because the, uh, the Education for Sustainable Development roadmap, uh, although it was launched two years ago, um, it actually builds on many of other efforts that are looking at the role of education to promote or reorient society towards sustainability. It's actually something that started, I would say, maybe in, uh, in 92 with Agenda 21, when the Earth Summit was happened and inside the, the many documents that emerged out of the Earth Summit was Agenda 21. And there was a chapter in Agenda 21 that looked at the role of education to, to, re, yeah, to promote sustainability or to make it happen at, the, at, the, at various levels. But um, the UN launched the UN Decade on Education for Sustainable Development that took place between 2005 and 2014. So actually this roadmap, the ESD for 2030 roadmap builds on these many other efforts that UNESCO has been promoting. Uh, one of them uh, very strong, which, which was the 10 year uh, Decade on Education for Sustainable Development that ended uh, at the end of 2014. But quite interesting, if we look at, uh, so the decade ended 24, uh, 2014, but then in 2015, the SDGs were launched. So um, there's sort of a convergence of, of agendas here happening because uh, I think one of the key reasons uh, or purpose for uh, the current uh, ESD uh, roadmap is actually looking at how central the SDG 4, specifically the SDG 4.7, how central that is for the whole SDG agenda. You know, that, that, that international cooperation, not only member states, governments, but also society in general, is working towards the implementation as much as possible of the, the 2030 agenda organized around the, the 17 SDGs. But the SDG 4 is essential to that. And, and of course, UNESCO and many others are seeing that it's central to the implementation of the whole 2030 agenda. And specifically what is written around in the target uh, of uh, SDG 4.7 that emphasizes the importance of uh, education for sustainable development and global citizenship, uh, global citizenship education and et cetera. So what is inside this roadmap that was launched uh, two years ago. And again, that builds on uh, the decade and also the, the GAP, uh, the UNESCO Global Action Program on ESD, that was really 
like a program that functions between what's happening now in this agenda and the end of the UN decade on ESD. So there were five priority areas. Uh, this roadmap articulates five priority areas. One of them is the importance to advance policy. Policy on what? Policy on education for sustainable development. So inside this realm, UNESCO is basically engaging, inviting um, uh, member states to develop policies, uh, national education policies on education for sustainable development. So the, not all countries have done that. I know, uh, of course, Kenya and Costa Rica and some other countries have actually developed, went through a process that started in 2014 to actually develop a national policy on education for sustainable development. Um, um, so that's one of the priority areas. The second priority areas under this UNESCO roadmap is transforming learning environment. What, that mean, what does that mean? Is looking at the physical space of schools and universities and looking at how important that is uh, for the whole learning process. So it's not just about bringing content to the learning process, but also looking at how we learn and where we learn. So it, 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 it involves this whole school approach or whole education, whole institution approach to education in, in the sense that it should reflect the values and principles of sustainability in this learning environment. Then priority area three involves the importance of enhancing the capacities of educators to make it happen, right? Um, so there is a clear understanding here that there is a number of, uh, there is an urgent need to reorient education towards sustainability, but the reality is that the, the educators are not even informed about that and let alone have the tools and, and the professional development to make it happen in practice. So that's actually a huge challenge. Priority area four involves the importance to engage, empower, mobilize young people to work in that sphere of non-formal education, right? Uh, and priority area five uh, is involving local governments, local communities in accelerating uh, the reorientation of our societies towards sustainability. I would say if we look at priority, priority area five and we combine it with priority area two, four, uh, they should not be seen as uh, separated in silos, but we could uh, envision that we, we manage to do transdisciplinary learning uh, if we manage to engage the schools or the universities with the local community, right? If we involve all these different priority areas all together in one shared pur purpose of transforming society. But I would like to briefly mention again, or just to make it visible for us, uh, these different education agendas uh, uh, with an effort for us not to see them as too separate <laughs> or too different from one another, although they are to a certain extent, organized at the institutional level, sometimes at the budgetary level, organized in, in silos. So one is the Futures of Education initiative that Fernando so clearly explained to us what it is all about. And then another one is the ESD for 2030 that I briefly shared here, which has this main goal to look at the role of education in, in implementing the SDGs, but also the importance of reorienting education uh, towards sustainability. So the important thing for us to emphasize here is that it's not just about education about sustainable development, but how can education really become a, uh, a central tool, a central instrument uh, to reorient society and learning towards sustainable development. So it's, it's, it's not just about education about sustainability. And then there is a whole effort and agenda and uh, policies being developed, research being developed on global citizenship education, right? And so to a certain level at the policy level at the UN or at the national level, these 
spheres of knowledge or education agenda could be seen separately, right? And they are to a certain point because there is specific focus uh, in each one of them. And then there is a whole effort around promoting climate change education and the importance to develop policy policies, programs on climate change education. So this clearly this week, uh, uh, there is a COP happening in Egypt. Um, we know that in the uh, Climate Change Convention, Article 6, in the Paris Agreement, Article 12, uh, they emphasize the importance of uh, promoting climate change education. So there's a whole energy uh, or wave <laughs> uh, being generated on the importance of uh, climate literacy. And then lastly, um, there's a whole effort that UNESCO is also undertaking uh, since last year and then this year, and it's going to be, uh, so I think, uh, concluding at the next UNESCO conference uh, next year, November next year, when the 1974 recommendation on education for international understanding, education for peace and human rights, this recommendation will, uh, will be renewed, will come to a, an upgrading, let's say, uh, and again, will elevate the importance of, uh, of a specific angle of education. But all of these efforts are really looking at education for change, uh, the role of education in, 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 as, as an enabler uh, for transformation. So the word will be really the role of education as, as central to the transformation of our societies towards a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. So I, I think I have been looking at each one of these pilots or these different education agendas, initiatives and efforts that UNESCO is promoting. And I see that there is one of these, the things that we can see that is uh, common there. It's very similar to the work we have been doing here with Earth Charter, which is, um, it involves the importance of, of nurturing, uh, cultivating, uh, a culture of care and responsibility, nurturing or cultivating or expanding our sense of care and responsibility to one another, to the greater community of life and to future generations. Uh, so there's an underlying understanding here on the importance uh, to cultivate uh, not only uh, more people who are literate about they're able to read and write and have just a formal education, but world citizens that have this planetary understanding and ecological and ec ethical literacy to really care with that education to care and contribute to the well being of societies in general. So, this sense of Earth community that we clearly see in, in the agenda of education for sustainable development in global citizenship education, the importance to amplify our, our worldviews and our sense of care, that we belong to an earth community. And with that, what is our rights, but also our ethical responsibilities uh, to the common good. The sense of interdependence, we belong to a global community, we are interconnected, that is underlying uh, in all these education agendas that I was just mentioning. And, and just a few other things that I see in common uh, between these agendas. One is this notion of cultivating and questioning our world, uh, cultivating values for sustainability or values for planetary citizenship, but also amplifying our worldviews. We see in, in all these agendas, uh, the importance uh, that is being emphasized on that education should be more contextualized, more meaningful, uh, more authentic. As Fernando has said, it's clearly articulated in, in the Futures of Education initiative and report. But we also see that same emphasis in these different other uh, education agendas. All of them are stressing the importance that education needs to be more participatory and student-centered, and this importance of bringing, not only looking at the cognitive learning, but also uh, 
the recognition on the importance of social and emotional learning, looking at the learner and the whole process in a more holistic way. And as Fernando has said, uh, looking at education through the lens of the process is more multi-dimensional. But the point here is uh, that for all of us is really to look at the gap, the real gap that exists between policies and education agenda, especially at the international level. And when it get, has to get to the national level, so developing policies and education agendas at the national level, bringing these various uni UNESCO or international agreements on education into the policies and national levels of, uh, of the education agendas. But what really happens in the classroom, what is really how the knowledge and the capacity of teachers, of schools and even universities to really change the way they are doing things, to how can they incorporate that into uh, their day-to-day -day, uh, teaching practice. So there is a, a gap that needs to be realized. And I think one important thing, again, for us to recognize is the importance to collaborate in enhancing and strengthening the capacity of educators to make the to, to make this happen, to bring this new reorientation into classroom. Because the reality, I would say, for a, a primary school teacher, secondary school teacher, or even a professor at the university, is that they are not going to say, okay, today I'm going to be teaching about global citizenship education. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be looking at climate change education. But how can we help them to look at this from a systemic lens uh, in looking at this different uh, education and agenda and policy agenda that UNESCO is generating and, and looking at it as a, as a wave of opportunity to reorient uh, uh, the way in which we have been perceiving uh, the process of teaching and learning. So of course, we here, we have been very interested in looking at that just finishing by saying we have been, at least from our UNESCO chair here, we have been looking at how can the values and principles of sustainability and global citizenship become more visible in, in processes of teaching and learning. I, I have certainly seen how much uh, uh, the notion of the importance of cultivating values is embedded in the Futures of Education report, how much that is also embedded in the education agenda of ESD, and certainly in global citizenship education, where they say, well, we need to strengthen uh, the uh, or amplify, extend, uh, I would say, the uh, consciousness of uh, world citizens on on the the responsibility or the ethical responsibility to care, and 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 to be responsible for uh, not only again for the closest community that they belong, but also to amplify our, our, our frontiers of responsibility that goes beyond our com local community, our country, and really enlarge it to, to the large community of life and humanity. So thank you so much for, for listening and be happy to engage in a conversation now. Uh, thank you so much, Miriam. I told you, I mean, from her presentation too, you know, telling us more about the work of UNESCO, we can see that all of us have an opportunity to be involved. For example, the priority areas from now to uh, 2030, she has mentioned them. I mean, advancing policy. So we need to all be involved in that, transforming learning, building capacity, empowering um, and mobilizing the young, and as well as the local government and community. We can all, we all have a role to play and we all have people that we can reach, you know? And again, um, I like the way she also focused, you know, on the issues that have been brought to light, you know, today, the issues of values, you know, education. She talked about um, enhancing, and strengthening the capacity of teachers. I think even that is core, because no matter how brilliant these policies are, how do we get them to the teachers who are teaching 
out there. I mean, it's okay for teachers who teach internationally or maybe in rich schools and so on. But there are many, many more teachers, thousands and thousands and thousands who are teaching in, at the local government level and so on. How will this reach them? Are they going to be outside the plan? And again, as she was just sharing, I just remember that what kind of uh, what kind of education or pedagogy are we going to be training them? Is it going to be a uniform kind? Because in my days when I was young, as I saw all the principles that um, Miriam mentioned, they were all reflected in the way I was taught in my village school. And I can still remember a local song that I was taught at the primary school level, which summarized, it summarized value, it contextualized you know, education, it talked about, it was participatory, it had all these things, but it didn't have those big names. And it was just a simple song about, it let, you know, that if you go to school without working, your education will be useless. You know, that you must remember that we are farmers. So whatever education you have has to be used to transform that. I mean, that was all in a song when I was about eight years old. And I can still remember, you know, today, you know, but it didn't have these big names we are calling them now. So how do we take into consideration those local knowledge and admit that, yes, there are people who are already doing these things at the local level? Anyway, let me, I run ahead of myself. Before we open, we are going to open this up, but there's one question I want to ask Fernandez. I, I was just wondering, why did you get involved in the commission? What's your own personal story? What were you looking for? What were you looking for? So the, 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 short answer, the short answer to that question is I was involved in the commission because I was invited to serve in it. And yes. I, I believe that if the world did not have UNESCO and the UN, we would need to invent it. I believe that uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the institutions that were created to advance them are essential to give us something that is closer to peace than if we didn't have them. And I am very, very concerned that the consensus on the importance of these institutions is being challenged by the rise of these national populist exclusionary movements around the world that are propagating an ideology that is every man for himself, every country for themselves. And I think if we study history, we know where that leads and inevitably, inevitably leads to interstate violence. So, so that's the reason why I, I was, uh, I accepted the invitation to serve. And, uh, you know, my, all my work has been about doing what is within my reach to help schools become what they were created to be, which is a place that helps people develop, become self-authoring individuals, become architects of their own lives and people with the ability to contribute, to shape the communities of which they are a part. That's why we have schools, that's why they were invented and they need some help in becoming that. Uh, for most students. And so I thought that joining others in the commission was a way to advance some of those aspirations. I guess that's the reason. I mean, I could, I could tell you, if I go back to my biography, why am I interested in education and in peace? Well, my mother lived through the Spanish Civil War, and she was a little girl when she experienced that war. And I grew up in a home where every dinner conversation was about how terrible a war is. And I went to school set up by refugees who came to Venezuela because they had left uh, France when Germany had occupied it. They were Jewish refugees. And my kindergarten teacher had been in a concentration camp. And so I had very early memories of the violence that humans are capable of against one another. But I was the beneficiary of the generosity of people who, in spite of those horrors that they had survived, believed that a better world was possible. If we gave students the opportunity, if we made schools that could anticipate a better future. So I suppose that because I benefited 
from their courage, from their efforts, I kind of, it seems normal that I should be part of helping to advance similar opportunities for others. You know, in, in that um, elementary school where I began my education, set up yeah. by French root Jewish refugees, the Ecole Jean-Jacques Rousseau, one of the things we did is we had a big emphasis in theater. And, uh, and I, I remember once we put on stage this wonderful book called The Little Prince. And there is a, I know that book by cœur, as we would say in French. And there is a line in that book, which is very important. On ne voit pas qu'avec le cœur, l'essentiel est invisible aux yeux. We can only see with the heart. What is essential is invisible to the eyes. Yeah. I think that when you look at the world in which we live, it is only when you see the world from a distance, when you see the fragility of this planet, that you really understand that we're either going to thrive together or perish together. That many of the institutions we have invented that the concept of nations, that all these various silos that Miriam was talking about, they just confuse us and get us lost in the details and prevent us from seeing the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that we're all in this ship together and it's our responsibility to steer it to a better course. And so to some extent, I'm not surprised that all these various efforts of the UN have a similar direction. Yes, they are all anchored on this basic idea that a world yes. in which we recognize you, the basic Peter. human rights of every person is a better world. Yeah, thank you, Peya. Thank you, thank you so much. Let me let me quickly ask uh, Miriam one question so that I can take two questions from um, everyone. I mean, the participants before we close this session. Um, Miriam, you know, from what Fernandez has just said now, there's so much education can do actually without people's will, people's heart. You know, and that is why the important gap of values, convictions need to be revived. What role is the Earth Charter, you know, playing in this regard? And what courses are available, you know, that help to fill this gap? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Akpezi and Fernando again. Uh, well, from my perspective, uh, one of the vacuums that we see in the world is not just more education because I have seen a lot of people, even in my own family um, and world leaders that are very well educated, <laughs> that have managed to go through PhDs and master programs, that are making a lot of decisions uh, with a problem of uh, eyesight impairment, <laughs> making decisions in the darkness, but decisions that are impacting a lot of people. So I see this as, a, as an issue of uh, a different kind of education, not just more education. And actually uh, in the global education uh, monitoring report of some years ago, UNESCO said that actually, uh, according to some studies, uh, the more the societies have uh, acquired more education, the bigger the uh, uh, ecological impact they have <laughs> in their uh, countries, so the bigger the ecological footprint. So, so I have been, through the lenses of the chart and the work we do here, we have been really trying to address that vacuum of, uh, of the, the importance, not only to have people more literate in the world, but more ethically literate. Um, yeah. So when we look at the, the role the Urshara can play is it can play a role of uh, a, a expanding and deepening our, our sense of belonging to the Earth community. And if the same way we belong to, uh, we are citizens of a country, and with that, uh, that entails rights and responsibilities, we also need to, to deepen our sense of belonging to the Earth community. Our, that's what I call planetary citizenship. But that and also entails rights and responsibilities. Um, yes. And it's not just a sense of responsibility, a vertical sense of responsibility, but when we talk about cultivating 
values and the sense of care for the well-being of the large living world. It's something that comes from within rather than it's a top-down. So I see that the the, the role their shadow can play is is plays as a, it, it has been playing actually is a, as an instrument uh, to expand our worldviews and our sense of uh, care and respect and our ethical literacy. And that's what we have been doing here uh, by engaging young people and educators um, to look at things through those lenses. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I think from what you have said, it's clearly that there are areas scope for you know, close cooperation between the Air Charter International, the work they do, and the International Commission on Futures of Education. But before I come back to you, can I ask anyone with questions or contributions to speak? I'll be able to take like two or three at, at the most. Um, one of the comments that have been made was made, has been made by um, Mr. Oke Ele, I think he's here. Can you, do you want to unmute yourself? And um, and speak, Mr. Oke Elia. Oh, thank, thank you very much, <clears throat> um, uh, 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 and and thank you very much, um, Fernando and Marian for for uh, uh, your your talks. They they're very very useful. Um, uh, it, it's it's the question I have is about. It seems as though um, all this is being focused on educational institutions. So while it is important to reorientate education and society, what, how can we include other stakeholders and influencers in the society? Because it's not just the kids and the university students that we want to reorientate their education, they're still going to come out into that society. And once they come out, what's going to happen? Are they going to join a particular group? They're going to be hindered based on their particular contexts, hindered by what goes on in those society. So how can we also educate the society, not just this, uh, 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 the education in the school? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll take two more questions, then I'll go back to our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Elia. Yeah, can you please unmute and ask a question? Who wants to speak next? Yeah, and I would like to, I mean, I can see here, there is um, Dr. Adesua, who has been working so hard on the, in this field of education for sustainable development. Do you have a question or do you have um, some contribution to the theme we're looking at? Dr. Adesua. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I do not have a question. I, I find this uh, meeting very useful, very inspiring. And I'd like to congratulate the speakers for their huge contribution to knowledge, as well as contribution to practice. And I think uh, as a practitioner, I am uh, really, really challenged <laughs> to do much more in, in the sphere of influence that I am. And also look forward to more opportunities to make a mark. So in every regard that we can contribute, uh, as, as we all are change agents, we must pursue that agenda and encourage others to do so as much as we can. And I think when we all do that collectively, we can secure a better future for, for ourselves and our uh, generations to come. I thank you so much, um, Dr. Pizzi, for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Any one more before I go back to our speakers? A quick one, a quick one. From anyone? Beverly Newberg has her, her hand raised. Yes, yes, yes thank you. Thank you. I would like really to, to, exp to thank you so much for your uh, presentations. And I would like to ask you, because our culture, culture may have a lot of knowledge, but not wisdom. Traditional culture cultivates wisdom and a connection with nature in a different way. And uh, I would like you to, to hear from you, how can we blend this different world vision in order to learn 
from each other. Wow, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Now we have just about like two minutes, you know, at most. Yeah, so can I ask you to do a miracle, Fernando, answer in one minute, then I will move to Miriam for one minute. Then no. I'll take a minute to close the meeting, okay. Uh, the, the UNESCO report on the futures absolutely uh, places front and center the importance of learning from different paradigms on from ancestral knowledge, uh, particularly when it comes to relating to the earth and to, and to one another, and uh, actually urges educators to rescue, to provide students opportunities to learn from those sources of knowledge. And it also, by the way, emphasizes that education is not only about school education, but it's about lifelong learning and so on. So uh, I, I'll conclude inviting all of you with us to download that report and take a peek at it, at least read the summary. And, uh, and if you're stimulated, then continue reading because the report was written for you, for those of you who are here as an invitation for you to figure out what are the implications of that report for change in the places that are within your reach. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Fernando. Yeah, the invitation is there. The, the invitation is out, jump in. Yes, Miriam, your one minute. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Oke, thank you for your comment on not for inviting us to not only be limited to formal education and uh, of course, when I was hearing you, it made me think about my daughter who just uh, ended her um, secondary school and is in her first year of university. But the fact is that she's incredibly more influenced by what she sees and hear through movies or through social media than what she's receiving in formal education. So I do realize that. And, and I think the only way for us to do it is to, to raise more awareness and sensitivity, especially to those people who can reach out to more uh, people, especially uh, the young generation, because it, it's a fact that informal education is playing certainly a, a very important role in informing the way we think and, and see the world. And, and Vavrili, thank you for your question and comment on knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have been addressing that quite a lot uh, in, in our work here, in our with our education, with our UNESCO chair in our education program. I, I see that Lillian Boyd is here from Kenyatta University. She's a professor there. And Lillian uh, is one of those who, uh, and uh, actually Rosaline Macion was also here. They were, they are certainly part of our, of the work we have been doing here with, a, with an online program, online certificate program on education for sustainable development in which uh, we have been looking at, at this uh, challenge uh, to explore that is not just about generating more knowledge and and increasing our, or looking at or focused at our cognitive learning, but also in, in cultivating uh, our heart <laughs> and, and also our wisdom. So I think actually Mark Hathaway is one of our, uh, our professors at our education program. And he has been doing a whole research on, on ecological wisdom and how we can move uh, to, to that next step of human, how, how we relate to one another, you know, and, and not only among humans, but how we move our knowledge to a level of wisdom that is, is not just limited to, to cognitive learning and to the books, uh, but it really goes into the heart of a human being. So thank you, Pavili, for that very important question. Yeah, thank you so much. Now I must say a big thank you to all of you who have joined in this conversation. The EFCHATA International has regular webinars like this. Please look at our web website and you'll be able to, uh, so that you can be informed of the next ones. And I would like to thank Fernando Remas. Thank you so much for drawing into your experience, going back, you know, some years back and bringing that 
to inspire us today. We are inspired and more knowledgeable than we came. Thank you very, very much. And Miriam, the woman who loves the future, who loves the environment, you know, thank you so, so much for the work you do. And thank you for the great knowledge that you have brought to us today. And just to say goodbye, let's remind ourselves again of the end game. What is it we are looking at? We want a more just, sustainable and peaceful world. And you can see that is the big challenge because we are not there. But then look at what we have. We are born explorers. There is an explorer inside all of us. We are born with insatiable desire to explore, to dive headfirst into the unknown and turn dreams into reality, to walk with time and not to flail in futility against indomitable weight. Let's turn the dream of a better future, a more just, sustainable and peaceful world to reality. Let's join the silent revolution of people like Malala and Greta, you know, of Fernando, of Miriam, of you, of you all here, you know, so that we can be transformers. This, this change agent that he talked about. And like Fernando said, the good we do matters. Let's take that home. Akpesi, thank you, thank so, you so, so much for your wonderful moderation. You're splendid. You're the best moderator that I've ever seen. It was such a pleasure to be with all of you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much.